Hello and welcome to today's Learn at Lunchtime program. I am Beth Erickson from the State Museum of Pennsylvania. Our topic today is freshwater mussels and with us is Nevin Welty, mussel biologist for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Hello Nevin, thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in freshwater mussels. Well, I had the good fortune back in 2000 to land an internship with the U.S. Geological Survey, snorkeling 120 miles up the Upper Delaware River looking for mussels. And uh, I kind of used that to spring on to uh, bigger things. And I went to Tennessee Tech for my master's degree. And I've been with the uh, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission since 2006 doing freshwater mussel work. That's great. Well, recently we had a Learn at Lunchtime program about the American eel population in the Susquehanna River Basin. And eels and freshwater mussels both live in Pennsylvania rivers, so it seemed appropriate that we should talk about freshwater mussels. But before you begin, I want to remind the audience that if anybody has a question about today's topic, please type it into the Q&A, and we will get to as many as we can after the presentation. So Nevin, please go ahead and share with us about freshwater mussels. All right, we'll do. All right, well, thanks for taking the time, everyone, um, from your busy days to check out the freshwater mussels of the Susquehanna River. Um, my talk today is more of an overview than anything, and this is going to be the outline that I'll follow. Um, basically, I'm going to go over a couple uh, interesting characteristics of the river basin that kind of reflects on the mussel fauna, um, talk a little bit about the mussels themselves. And really, I think the take home point that I want to drive home today is that they're awesome and you should care about them. And I'll also talk a little bit about what the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission is doing for mussel conservation in the Susquehanna River Basin. So I guess the first thing is maybe take a look at the image at the top. This is um, the life that I signed up for, um, which is snorkeling um, in beautiful Pennsylvania streams and rivers during the summertime, usually under very warm conditions and uh, very clear water. Although this isn't always the case for uh, a fish commission biologist, but this is one of the lucky perks of my job. So the river basin. Uh, the Susquehanna is a, an extremely large basin and Pennsylvania has <laughs> a great portion of it, over 50% of the basin is in our state, or excuse me, over 50% of the state is occupied by the Susquehanna. Uh, it's the longest commercially non-navigable river in the United States, and it's entirely, well, it's the longest East Coast tributary entirely in the United States. So it's, it's a massive river system uh, with some pretty cool uh, geology that affects um, the species distribution. Sorry. So the northern part is actually glaciated, and this is significant because in New York, uh, we have some interesting species that really don't occur in any sort of numbers in Pennsylvania. And towards the south, you get towards the influence of the Chesapeake Bay and um, the influence of the tides down there. So the fauna down in Maryland is a little bit different than what we have in Pennsylvania. But Pennsylvania is home to uh, many mussels and it's an enormous uh, system. Some major uh, sub-basins in the state include the West Branch Susquehanna, the Juniata River, and the upper, middle, and lower Susquehanna basins. So what are some of the mussels that live here? Um, this is the cool part right here. Uh, but before we get right into which mussels do what, it's important to understand the life history of freshwater mussels. Uh, mussels, uh, just to be born, undergo uh, a pretty complex life cycle that involves uh, an obligate attachment or parasitism onto a freshwater fish. And so what the males have to do is release sperm into the water column, which is then sent downstream to a female, uh, who then broods larvae called glochidia. And this is where things get pretty interesting and kind of wild and crazy. So the female has to somehow find a way to get those larvae or glochidia onto the host fish. And in this particular instance for this mussel, um, they're trying to attach to a bass, but not all mussels use one fish or many fish. Uh, it could just, it varies and depends. And we'll look at that here in a little bit. But so the female will somehow get the larvae to attach to the gills or the fins of the fish. And the fish actually serves as kind of like a vessel 
that move the muscle around in the Susquehanna River Basin. So that's how muscles really can move upstream. Um, and so these larvae are on the gills for maybe about two to four weeks before they drop off as juveniles, only to start their life um, all over again in a new area. And so you might imagine that, you know, if a river is dirty or muddy, or for some reason, a muscle cannot connect to its host, then there might be some conservation concerns. And this is uh, true not only for the Susquehanna River Basin, but for all um, river basins in North America. Uh, we have about 300 species uh, in North America, 67 in Pennsylvania itself, and most of them are in some sort of impairment or um, in terms of uh, whether they're federally protected, state protected, or some sort of species of greatest conservation need. So they're, they're all in danger for various types of reasons. And um, although we have a lot of species in Pennsylvania, we only have 13 in the Susquehanna, but they're still pretty cool. There's no state or federally listed animals in the Susquehanna River Basin, at least not as of yet, although several species are currently under review for uh, state or federal endangered or threatened species status. Um, currently, a lot of the mussels in the Susquehanna are considered species of greatest conservation need. They are facing threats and they are in need of conservation. So here's a little list of the uh, species uh, in the Susquehanna. And I think one thing to point out of the 13 species, a lot of them are kind of described as floaters. So what's unique about the Susquehanna fauna is that a lot of them have pretty thin shells, um, hence the name floater. Their, their shells are light enough that they may be able to float on top of the water. So I'm gonna highlight a few of them. Uh, and some of these are the, the Eastern elliptio, the yellow lamp mussel, the Eastern lamp mussel, the elk toe, creeper, and rainbow. So the Eastern elliptio is maybe a, a muscle you've heard about, especially as it relates to the American eel. Um, this is the dominant Susquehanna River species historically, and they're huge um, filtering machines. They can filter enormous amounts of water. What we know about the Delaware River uh, Eastern elliptio is that they can filter about 10 gallons of water per hour. And in that river system, there are about one to 2 million mussels per mile. So you can imagine the filtering capacity delivered by just one species in one river. Unfortunately, um, for the Eastern Elliptio and the Susquehanna, its primary host is the Catadromus American eel. So the, the challenge is for this host to get past these large dams on the river uh, to migrate both upstream and also to come back downstream because um, folks may know that the American eel spawns in the Sargasso Sea and then comes back um, as small or small small fishes. So there's a challenge to uh, um, get the kind of numbers in the Susquehanna comparable to what we have in the Delaware. The yellow lamp muzzle is another really cool critter from the Susquehanna. It's like this glowing yellow orb in the bottom of the river, and they're really really cool. Um, the, this mussel is a little bit different. It doesn't use an American eel as its host. It uses a smallmouth bass, uh, which we know is a um, fantastic fishery in the Susquehanna. So the presence of a good smallmouth bass fishery and other um, centricids or sunfish um, is a very good indicator that this species will survive and thrive for, for a long time, hopefully, in the Susquehanna. Um, like the Eastern Elliptio, um, this is a larger mussel and probably has a pretty good filtering capacity, although it doesn't reach the sheer numbers of the Eastern Elliptio. So it's a pretty cool critter. And it's always one that I get really excited to see because it just oh, it kind of just stares up at you from the river bottom. The Eastern lamp mussel is another really unique mussel in the Pennsylvania, mainly because it's so rare. Uh, what we do know about the uh, species is that it occurs in the West Branch and also in the North Branch of the Susquehanna. But the primary strongholds for this species are in the New York portion of the Susquehanna River Basin and also down uh, further south in Maryland. So one of the thoughts that we're having is maybe it could be potentially habitat limited. This is actually a species that's undergoing a state status assessment as we speak. So brook floater is another uh, kind of fascinating also, but, uh, but also a rare species in the basin. 
Uh, this one is under federal review for listing. And it's unique in that it uses a slimy sculpin as one of it says. So what you're seeing with these mussels is that they're all using a, probably a, a wide range of, of fishes for, for their host. And this one is restricted to some of the, our more high quality systems in the, in the basin, such as Pine Creek, the tributary to the West Branch Susquehanna, and also streams like Penn's Creek. Um, I'm, I have a little bit of a biogeography background. So one of the really fascinating species to me, or actually a pair of fascinating species are the elk toe and the creeper. And these are headwater species um, traditionally found in the Ohio River Basin, but we actually have them in the Susquehanna. And the thought is that these mussels could have been introduced to the river from uh, glacial connections in the upper center upper Susquehanna and the Genesee all the way to the Allegheny. So we might have mussels that have moved from the Allegheny uh, during post-glacial times over to the Susquehanna. The other interesting thing is that we know the West Branch Susquehanna River has captured uh, some of the streams in the Ohio River Basin. And what that means is that the steepness of the streams has eroded through the mountains and captured streams on the other side. So historically, some of the streams that drain to the Ohio River Basin now actually drain to the Susquehanna. So that might be one of the possible origins for the creeper mussel in the Susquehanna. So while they're maybe not like true like natives, like prior to glaciation, they are certainly naturally uh, brought into the system. And that kind of leads me to uh, this next mussel, the rainbow mussel. This is a really pretty mussel. If you're into just looking at freshwater mussel shells, or if you like walking along streams and looking at shells, it's a beautiful mussel, stands out for its um, brilliant rays on a kind of a straw colored background. It's pretty neat. But what's interesting about it is that we don't have any records of this species in Pennsylvania prior to 1919. And so we think it's an introduction. And there's actually a little tidbit from the Philadelphia Academy of Science from a guy named S.S. Haldeman uh, who lived along the lower Susquehanna. And he mentions collecting live Ohio River mussels and placing them into the river around 1841. Whether that individual is the source for this rainbow mussel is, is speculation at best, but it is intriguing. So there's some debate and, you know, I guess some curiosity on how this mussel ended up in the basin. Currently, it's pretty widespread. And um, this muscle would use uh, also, uh, and I don't think I put it on here and I apologize for that, but they would use a centrarchid or a sunfish for a host fish, such as a smallmouth bass or a rock bass. So this slide is just kind of a, just a demonstration of the, the different shell variations of the different species in the Susquehanna River Basin. What you'll notice a lot of them are kind of like round and brown. There's not very, much in the way of distinct sculpturing like you might get in some of the other river basins, but that's okay. As a biologist, I get excited about having a challenge to identify different species. Um, so it's a wonderful watershed in terms of uh, species diversity. And it's definitely, if you guys are out and about along a stream or river, you should be on the lookout for, for these types of mussel shells. So one of the things that I always try to emphasize to folks is just how cool these critters are. I actually had and someone ask me the other day, it's like, hey, are mussels bad for anything um, for people or for wildlife? And, and I had to sit there for a moment and think, and, and I honestly, I, I still can't come up with anything. So I'm gonna go through a few things or a few reasons why I think they're awesome. As mentioned, they're incredible. Uh, incredibly efficient uh, filter feeders. They have the ability to process gallons and gallons of water per day and um, just provide a, a free uh, water filtration service to, to people and to the rivers themselves. I mean, I think one of the ideas if we had enough of a restored muscle community in the Susquehanna, we could actually contribute to uh, nutrient reduction in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so mussels are home also to invertebrates, uh, which lead to you know, more small fish, which lead to larger fish and the sport fish. So indirectly, mussels are definitely a good indicator that you know, a stream is probably a high qual quality fishery of some sort. Um, they're an incredible food resource for uh, fish and wildlife. 
Um, primarily in the Susquehanna River Basin, we would be looking at muskrats, um, raccoons, and otters, and those sort of things. They love to eat mussels. So it's a good food source, not only for um, just the, for um, mammals or whatever, um, it, it just, yeah, they're, they're excellent. So th from a biologist standpoint, uh, one of the things we get really excited about is that they serve as canaries in the coal mine. Uh, we've noticed in kill investigations that uh, mussels tend to be the first thing to go. And then after they get sick or start to die, then we notice that the fish start to get sick and to, and to die. So if we monitor our mussels uh, closely and we keep an eye on them, we can kind of monitor the water quality in the system and maybe take steps to avoid uh, a disaster if there's one that might be pending. Um, kind of as mentioned for the Susquehanna, I get excited about the species diversity in mussels. They're basically a coral reef here in Pennsylvania. You can get really fired up to walk along a stream bank and find something really bizarre and interesting. And they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes with warts and lines and, and all sorts of interesting features. And with that, um, you know, a lot of my interest in mussels comes from this amazing life cycle. So it seems on his face, maybe even from this graphic, it's like it's kind of a dull, you know, life history, you know, like there's a fish, there's some larvae that look like Pac-Man and might attach to a fish somehow. It's how they do it that's really incredible. And I'm gonna show you a few uh, photos and some videos on this and uh, it'll probably blow your mind. So the few things that I'm gonna talk about are strategies for mussels to get their larvae onto fish. Um, two of them are the conglutinates, which are basically a packet of larvae uh, that's thrown onto the ground or, or into the riverbed uh, for fishes to come along and try to bite onto. The other one is mantelores. Mantelores are these little mimics that resemble fishes and try to entice a, um, a pred predaceous fish to come along and take a nibble. So the first one I'm going to talk about a little bit about is this um, conglutinate that lays on the river bottom. So they're demersal, which means they kind of stick to the river bottom. So the female, um, and this muscle here is uh, a kidney shell. Um, and what we have in the top right hand corner is a gill that's been removed from the muscle. And what you can see in this muscle's gills are these little packets um, that resemble black fly larvae, which is that image on the bottom right. And what they do is they will release this uh, larvae and it'll stick onto the bottom and entice the fish. Another uh, type of kidney shell that we have in Pennsylvania will produce um, almost a juvenile fish uh, lure or uh, mimic for a conglutinate. So that's what that is on the lower left. And so I'm gonna play for you a video that shows some darters uh, eating these conglutinates. And what you'll notice, watched around the gills, you'll see these tiny microscopic, almost microscopic uh, glaucidia coming out and right there, like a little cloud. And glaucidia, and while parasitic, aren't necessarily um, fatal or, you know, an annoying to, to fish. They're annoying, but they're not going to hurt the fish. And then this is another one called a super conglutinate. While we don't have uh, any mussels in Pennsylvania that use this method, it's pretty wild. They have a long, clear tether um, that attaches a conglutinate or a crazy series of conglutinates actually um, behind it and that will kind of free float in the water column. And I'll show you that here in one second. So this white and black line thing is actually a pack, series of packets of glycidia flowing behind the muscle. You can kind of see the clear tube that's holding it tethered to the muscle. The next thing that I'll talk a little bit about that I think is really fascinating are these mantle lures, uh, or basically these protrusion from the female muscle that resemble a fish prey item, whether it's a crayfish or some sort of darter or minnow. Uh, what's interesting, and I, I need to mention this, is that 
muscles don't have eyes. So somehow these critters have evolved these structures, whether it's a conglutinate or a mantle lure that really mimic um, a prey item and how they did that over time is mind boggling, but somehow they figured it out and it's an effective method for getting larvae to the fish host. So this is a plain pocketbook filtering on the bottom of a river. All right, this next one is uh, of the rainbow and this rainbow muscle occurs in the Susquehanna River Basin. So you can imagine kind of stumbling across this site and just wondering, you know, hey, what the heck's going on? So not only does this uh, lore resemble a uh, crayfish, the movement of the female muscle also <laughs> resembles the movement of a crayfish. It's uncanny and it's amazing. And finally, I have an example of a um, single species, the wavy rayed lamp mussel, uh, that has a, a variety of different lures. Uh, this is filmed down in North Carolina, but Pennsylvania probably has two to three versions of this lure. So not nearly as many as the, the um, North Carolina specimens, but check it out. So the yellow lamp mussel that's in the Susquehanna has a miniature version of this type of lure um, that attracts the fish. So it's not as grandiose as this, but it's still pretty cool. Uh, we have some black sand shells in the high river basin and some mussels it's almost seems like we don't know what they're trying to do but this one um, has a really unique lore in that it just kind of waves at you almost perhaps like a helger mite we're not really sure what it resembles so there's a lot of mystery still out there as far as mussel reproduction goes so if there's any students on this um, on this stream then there's lots of research opportunities out there and lots of discoveries waiting to be made. All right, so the last method I'm gonna talk a little bit about is this method used, some of our, used by some of our species in the high river basin to actually capture host fish uh, in order to transfer their uh, larvae to the fish. And this one here is a uh, female snuff box, and they have these recurved teeth on the end of their shell designed to hold on to log perch, um, which we have some log perch in the uh, Susquehanna, namely the Chesapeake one, but this is different and it's pretty cool. So log perch like to roll stones to look for food. And in this case, we're, they have, um, this muscle has probably a little bit of a lure that maybe resembles a, uh, a snail or something that uh, would interest the log perch. You can almost see this fish's eyes get wide as soon as it puts his nose into the shell. All right, so just looking at the life history, you can almost begin to, you can begin to understand why some of these critters are so imperiled. If the water is muddy, if we're 
doing damage to the environment, there's a good chance that um, we're kind of separating the muscles from the host. So it's important that we continue to try um, to incorporate efforts to do some restoration. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing for uh, Susquehanna River Basin Muscle Conservation. And right now we're really focused on planning. We just got a grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundi Foundation to do some uh, conservation planning statewide for freshwater mussels. And right now uh, our efforts have been pretty much opportunistic and a little bit more ad hoc, but we'd like to be a little bit more systematic about it. Uh, we also have some ongoing species status assessments, both at the state level for um, brook floater, eastern lamp mussel, um, but also um, we know there's a federal effort to look at the um, brook floater uh, status as well. We're really um, moving forward on, in the western basins on some trying to determine stream recovery potential using mussel silos, and this is an effort we want to expand to Susquehanna. And uh, we're excited. We know there's some uh, future opportunities to partner with our uh, state colleagues down in Maryland and perhaps New York to um, do some more uh, good for muscle conservation in Pennsylvania. So this silo thing that I mentioned um, is one type of effort that we're using in the Western part that we're gonna bring to, the, uh, to Susquehanna. And basically we're using these concrete bunkers that have a PVC insert inside of them. Um, and there's a screen on both ends and inside this uh, PVC insert, you can kind of see it on, on the top of your screen, we place juvenile mussels. And these we put into the stream and we monitor over time uh, growth and survival. And so we wanna basically see how these um, animals are doing in each of these streams. And we can probably do a, a ranking exercise to determine which streams are ready for uh, mussel restoration efforts. And right now within our agency, we're, we currently have one mussel hatchery and the hope is eventually it may be expand that um, effort to the Susquehanna raising mussels for, the, for that river or working with our partners down in Maryland. So as I mentioned, I'd like to use these silos to start doing some more work in the Susquehanna and determine which streams we can begin work almost immediately and kind of go from there. Um, the West Branch Susquehanna looks like a prime target at this point, but uh, we're certainly going to branch out and look at all the different sub basins and see how they're doing. And the other benefit besides growth and survival, we'll be able to learn what sort of limiting factors there may be in a stream or watershed. Um, maybe there's some on the landscape things that we need to do in order to get these streams ready so they can receive mussels and that the mussels can survive and thrive in these streams. So with that, I just, I feel optimistic, I, I guess would be my, my word of the day um, for the Susquehanna. I mean, the critters in, in the basin are amazing. They got super cool life histories and I get really excited anytime I get a chance to go out there and snorkel around. Um, and it's, it's good for what I see, but I also know that there's a lot of restoration potential that um, based upon my experience in the Delaware, you know, I can imagine the Susquehanna, you know, one point, hopefully, um, in the not too distant future, you know, harboring also millions of mussels per mile. So with that, I just want to say thank you guys for taking the time today. Um, feel free to email me with any questions. And also, so, um, the folks at the Uni Unio Gallery uh, are, have awesome videos. So if you get a chance, please go over to that website and check it out. Thank you so much for sharing this information about these unique animals. Those were great images and videos. It's amazing how complicated their life is. And I love that interesting history story about the rainbow mussel. That was really cool. Um, you're, um, we're gonna take some questions from the audience at this point, but I do wanna tell you, your enthusiasm for freshwater mussels is definitely contagious. So <laughs> I'm gonna start with one that I think a lot of people might have is, what is the difference between mussels and clams? And do we have clams in Pennsylvania? That's a really good question. Um, so mussels, interestingly, usually have some sort of uh, bissel thread or some sort of uh, way to attach themselves to rocks. And clams are known to be uh, to bury themselves into the sand. So the freshwater mussels, as we know them, are probably better described as freshwater clams. However, we've been using the term freshwater mussels for so long that it's kind of like one of these things that we just accept. Um, as true. Other, the other thing, uh, we used the term glochidia to describe the larvae, and that was actually a term that we used to 
uh, name, we thought it was a pair was like an independent parasite at one point that it was uh, like a, like a disease for, <laughs> for fishes, but it's actually not. So, um, but that term is stuck around. So instead of larvae, we could still use the name Glochidia. What animals would be predators of mussels? Uh, muskrats, um, otters, and raccoons are the biggest one that I've seen. Uh, muskrats can do an incredible amount of damage uh, depending on the mussel community and how hungry <laughs> the muskrats are. So it just depends, but muskrats are probably the largest predator of freshwater mussels. So if other animals are eating them, then they must be edible. So can you eat them? And if so, what would they taste like? Uh, well, I, <laughs> the answer is yes, but um, a, a few things. Um, mussels, in my experience, tend to taste like the river. Uh, and the <laughs> other thing that they have that makes them a little unpalatable is this enzyme called putrescine. So pretty much whenever you kill a mussel, it begins to smell like death almost instantaneously. So they're, they can be pretty smelly and pretty foul. And... Um, yeah, it, they don't taste very good, but can you eat them? Yeah, I, I, I probably would not advise it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the lifespan for, it may, maybe it varies from muscle to muscle, but what's the average lifespan? Well, muscles can live um, either for a rather short period of time, potentially like maybe two to five years, all the way up to 200 years. Uh, we have the Eastern Pearl Shell and the Delaware River Basin, and that animal can live over 200 years um, easily. So yeah, it just depends on the species and the life history. Do you have a favorite muscle? My favorite is probably the snuff box, just because, and I think I should, in the video, those females just latch onto those fishes and it's just such an amazing, like cool life history strategy. In the shells, I, I'm a bit of a, um, you know, I have an interest in collecting shells. So their shells are amazing and they're just super beautiful, really strong um, and brilliantly colored. So they're a lot of fun to look at. So I think that's probably my favorite muscle. We have a couple questions um, about freshwater lakes and ponds. What muscle species might we expect to find in freshwater lakes and ponds? And do they differ from those found in flowing water systems? It really depends. Uh, naturally, um, we have some lakes in the Delaware system uh, that were colonized post-glaciation by the eastern elliptio, but more often than not, it's uh, a pond or a lake is usually stocked with some sort of fish, and those fishes are occasionally can bring in hitchhikers from other waterways. So what we usually see in lakes and ponds are some of the thin-shelled uh, floaters, like the giant floater, the eastern floater, uh, the paper pond shell, like those sort of species. Um, we don't really have a two or too many rare species that occur in lakes and ponds. They tend to be pretty common um, host generalists, they, which means they use a lot of different species for, for their host. Um, are there any invasive mussel bivalve species that are threatening competing with natives? And another question asked that also um, about the Asiatic clam in Pennsylvania. Very good questions. Um, so in terms of um, the Susquehanna, we have zebra mussels kind of not really wreaking havoc on, on mussels in the Susquehanna River Basin, but perhaps worse is in our um, Ohio River Basin, we have the Round Gobi and the French Creek watershed, <clears throat> excuse me, and that system is very diverse, and we have a molluscivore, which is this Round Gobi that's um, kind of encroaching into the system. We're still studying it. We don't really have a definitive answer on the impacts or in the amount of impact that this animal is having over there, but that's a pretty nasty one. As far as the Asian clam, uh, that is something we are working with the U.S. Forest Service on right now. We're, we're doing, uh, we're partnering on some silo studies and trying to understand um, the impacts of the Asiatic clam on at least our western streams and rivers. Uh, it seems like where we have more Asian clams, we tend to have fewer native freshwater mussels. This is anecdotally and not, hasn't been quantified, but yeah, we're looking at that. And that's something that's a real concern. And we just don't fully understand the, the Asiatic clam um, issues at the moment, but, but we're getting there. Are there any mussels found in the Conewago Creek area? Yes, that's one of my favorite streams. Uh, so I guess it depends on which one you're talking about. Um, the one that comes in from the east has loads of eastern elliptios, uh, triangle floaters. I think um, 
a creeper like and there's a lot of diversity in that stream and i get excited anytime i get a chance to go over there so that's a pretty cool one um what oh sorry there was a couple different questions would it be would it help the species grow in population if man-made beds were made available for them to attach to in addition to them attaching onto fish in the river or do they have to use the fish um, so from a propagation standpoint, um, we tend to use fishes um, as a convenient way to transform juvenile or larvae into juveniles. Um, there are some ways in the hatchery setting to use uh, what's called in vitro propag propagation, which is like kind of like a blood auger type of situation where you put this larvae on there, they can transform without a host. So that's kind of where things are at currently with um, muscle culture. Uh, they're, they're, they're a tricky animal. Um, some of the hatcheries, um, particularly in the, in the federal system, are experimenting with new ways to try to make things a little bit more efficient and uh, improve that. But th those are the only two ways that I know of at the moment. So again, you have this passion for mussels, and I have heard you describe them as being charismatic. Do freshwater mussels really have a personality? Well, I, I tend to think so. I mean, I think if you look at anything long enough, you're like, man, this is really cool. Um, I've had people tell me like, hey, they're just muscles or they're just rocks with lines on them. And I'm like, that's not true. Um, so no, I, I think muscles, you know, in their own way, you know, it's like anything. If, if you don't know someone, you know, until you get to know that person, you're like, oh, okay, you know, this, this person's actually pretty interesting or whatever. You just have to spend time with them or just, you know, think about them more than just, you know, rock with a line on it. So yeah, I, I do think they have personalities um, in the sense that, you know, they're unique, they're different, um, their life history is amazing, uh, especially for an animal with no eyes. I mean, it's, it's just wild. So yeah, I get, I get fired up about them. That's very true. So, and that leads to this question. So is the luring that they do seasonal? Do they do it all year long? How does that happen? That's a great question. Um, so the lures are used, uh, I guess, seasonally for most species, uh, typically in like the March, April, May, early June type of period, uh, they'll try to kind of come out. And the reason for this is a lot of mussels would try to time their uh, lures or their release of glochidia for the, the fish spawning runs, you know, moving into some of the shallows or into the different streams and rivers. Uh, there are some mussels that will spawn several times a year, like the uh, Plain Pocketbook in the Ohio River Basin, we know has a, like kind of a spring brooding time and a fall brooding time. It may not be the same female for both uh, periods, but um, females of that species will brood at several, several different times during the year. Um. You've, you've said you've spent time um, in the rivers and the streams, you're, you're looking through what, besides mussels, what's the strangest thing that you've found while you've been out there? Well, we, we found all sorts of things. Um, as you might imagine, you, it runs the gamut from like cool fishing gear, canoe paddles, um, parts of boats occasionally. Um, you know, and, and to, into some of the maybe like darker things, uh, we found uh, firearms. I, I do remember being on a stream in west or in the southwest part of the state, and we found a, a 270 uh, Ruger rifle. It's like, oh, okay, that's probably, uh, you know, something from a scene of a crime. So <laughs> we, we see those sort of things. We also find really interesting um, uh, artifacts. Occasionally, we'll come across like Native American fishing weights or arrowheads, like that sort of stuff. So it just like anything, the more time you spend in, in that environment, you find all sorts of weird stuff. Do you have a specific muscle story? That's like the story you tell at parties and things? Um, I, probably over some beverages, I, I tell all sorts of stories. Um, <laughs> but I'm, in terms of muscle stories, um, I'm trying to think if there's anything that really stands out. Um, I think it's probably more related to the, some of the crazier things we've seen out there, you know, like such as like that fi the firearm that we found, like those sort of things. Um, nothing too too wild and crazy muscle specifically related, but we've had some boat in instances and, and that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's been an adventure out there for sure. We have this one specific question about the Union City Muscle Propagation Area. So one of the audience, someone in the audience wants to know if that is up and running. Yes, yeah, so our, our Union City Muscle Hatchery is up and running. It is doing 
pretty darn good right now. Uh, we have about 17,000 mussels on station. Uh, Scott Ray, he's our hatchery manager up there. Uh, he's been really just cranking through some of the more common species right now. Uh, we've been partnering with our uh, colleagues down in uh, White Sulphur Springs National Fish Hatchery, and they've been helping us with uh, providing some juvenile mussels for us to hold and eventually grow out and into stock. So yeah, we're doing pretty good. We have one, two, three, I think maybe seven or eight species on station and in, in active culture. Um, we're primarily focused on some of the lampsilla species, such as wavy raid lamb mussel, fat muckets, plain pocketbooks. And those are the, kind of the big three that we're working on the most right now. We're just trying to refine our technologies and get better at what, what we're doing. Uh, but yeah, we have several trials going on right now and it is doing quite well. Um, at some point, it, it's perhaps a personal uh, hope of mine is that we can expand beyond the Union City hatchery, but we're, we're going to try to get this up and running and, and nailed down as tightly as we can before we start thinking bigger. Great. Thank you so much for answering all the questions and thank you to our audience for the questions. If you want to explore more about this topic or other topics related to Pennsylvania, visit the Fish and Boat Commission website or the State Museum of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania website. Our links are in the chat box. And thank you, Nevin, for sharing this information and your passion about freshwater mussels today. All right. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So we hope that you will join us for our next Learn at Lunchtime program. Visit our webpage for more information and to sign up. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>